everybody. Welcome to another Sunday morning conversation. Uh, today, my guest is Eric Thielen. He is a neurology resident at the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm, Sweden. So yeah, everybody, we're going to talk TBI. Uh, I talk a little bit of COVID with him because I know Sweden never locked down. And uh, so it definitely is an interesting conversation. I hope you take part and listen. Thank you, everybody. How are you, Doc? I'm good, thanks. Just looking for a better angle, maybe to white balance this horrible video somewhat. You okay, Eric? I am. I'm doing well. Yeah. Are, are you on um, you a call today? Yes. So this is actually our on call room is a hotel room, an actual hotel room. Is it, but because is it in a hotel? It's not in a hotel? It is in a hotel. So the, I'm on the seventh floor of a hotel right now. This is also, this is Karolinska University Hospital here in, in Stockholm. And uh, this is due to COVID. And the conditions were that we were actually before sleeping in uh, patient rooms, but they needed the beds, of course, due to COVID. Uh, and uh, then they moved us to this hotel and we got a good deal because the hotel didn't have any guests of course, because of COVID. So um, it was a sweet deal for both because this room is quite nice, to be honest. And it's just right across the street, so that works out. It is, it is. So how is, uh, first of all, I guess, how has COVID been uh, over there in Sweden? In Sweden, uh, I don't know if you've read about it in the news because we were quite famous because we had very loose quarantine rules. Basically, we haven't had any sort of closures of the schools have always been open up until like high school level where they have introduced sort of uh, online learning uh, but the universities have always been open and everything like daycare nurseries the like kindergarten everything um, and I'd say that the like mass transit systems have always been open you always able to go on buses and the subway um, but yes people are working more uh, from home of course so we've adapted some somehow some way but uh, i'd say that due to the loose restrictions we had quite a few cases in the beginning but in terms of over mortality towards the end when it sort of calculated everything put together it wasn't that bad so we haven't had that much more many more deaths due to covid in comparison to other countries in northern europe so it's, it's actually turned out all right they were lucky, I guess. Yeah, I mean, right. Is there, I mean, I heard that in Europe, they're having a flare up right now uh, or whatever yeah. it is of some variant. We don't have that yet. We're usually like three weeks behind you guys. Yeah, no, that, that's true. Actually not in Sweden, but in Germany. And I'm going to a conference in Germany, a neurotrauma conference in July. And they're having it quite rough actually. So they, they're talking about making it like an online conference, but I booked the airplane tickets. I, I'm going. Are they so, refundable? <laughs> uh, they, they, they are, but I, will, I want to go because I've been staying in Sweden for so long now. I will be in Germany next year, but not for a conference. Oh. I'm going there for a triathlon. Mm. I noticed that you, you, you do quite a few triathlons. You. I, I do. Um, you know, I this was actually a thing I started in 2014 before my TBI. Um, right. I uh, I started it because my swim team uh, that I coached on the side uh, they had been egging me on to do one because there were some triathletes on a team. So I did one, and if you do one, you're either going to be hooked or you never want to do it again. There's no in between. Yeah. So and then challenge Roth is like the most one of the most iconic races out there and uh, you know i'm never going to make a world championships because i'm not just fast enough but for roth i can get in because it's a lottery so i'm like okay. all right we're going to do that cool and then i'll bring my mom which the logistics of coming from america to germany for a race are tough um, and not a lot of americans go out there to do it it's just not a you know your Americans just don't go come and race in Europe, but they, you know, Europeans come race over here all the time. I'm like, well, it has to be possible then. So, and I live in Atlanta, so at least I can get direct flights over to Germany. That's nice. Yeah. So, Doc, tell me about, you know, you're a neurology resident. Tell me what your experience with TBI is like. I know what mine's been like. So, <laughs> I mean, I'm sure you've seen more than that. 
Yes. So to be honest, I became a neurology resident quite recently. So my career, I finished medical school in 2009, and then I wanted to become a neurosurgeon. So I spent a few years in neurosurgery, and then I did my PhD, and then I sort of got on and off on calls, and I sort of did a one, one and a half years of residency in neurosurgery, but I realized that I don't want to operate. I don't find surgery that appealing. Um, so I, I, I do find it, I, I do find it, I do find it to be okay, but I don't want to excel in it, which I think that you need to feel if you really want to be become a neurosurgeon. And currently in Sweden, uh, neurologists such as myself, we don't manage TBI patients. Oh. So no, mild TBI patients are managed by the emergency physicians, basically, to decide if you need to do a CT of the head to see if they have a bleed or not. And then in terms of uh, the severe TBIs, the severe traumatic injuries, they're managed by the neurosurgeons and the neurocritical care units. They perform evacuations of hematomas. They monitor intracranial pressure and metabolism, which is done together with anesthesiologists. And then when they're discharged to the rehab clinics, it's basically only rehab physicians that are um, taking care of them throughout their whole post-op and post-TBI care. Oh, that's, uh, that's definitely interesting. It doesn't work that way here in the States. No, I know, because I know quite a few neurosurgeons who have quite a few, and neurologists that have quite a few mild or severe TBI patients that they follow for quite a long time. Yeah, I was with my neurologist for three plus years until we got to the point where it's like, well, there's nothing really more I can do for you. And, you know, I'm like, okay, you're expensive. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's free good. here, though. Yeah, about that. <laughs> I try to try to do my part and vote for people who will get free health care, but I don't think it's ever going to happen here. <laughs> it might. Well, it might be sort of if I, I I'm not going to go into politics, but you might expand Medicare to make it somewhat a single payer system in a way. But I, I agree that the way that the system in the U.S. is constructed it's difficult to make it a single payer system, I think. Well, to, to touch lightly on politics, it's just, it, it, first of all, um, because everything's based on, I don't know how Sweden looks like. Do you have something like states or provinces? We do. Okay. We, so, we call them regions. Okay. So we have 50 states and they're all, you know, led by different governors and re state legislatures. And um, whether there are options to expand Medicare or not, are all based on who's running your state legislature and your governor. Your state legislature has to pass it. Your governor, you know, signs off on it. And if you're a Republican state, odds are you're not going to expand your Medicare. A lot of governor, uh, some have, but the Democratic ones will uh, expand their Medicare. So, yeah, like I'm in Georgia. They won't, they're not going to expand Medicare because the Republican Party doesn't like the idea of handouts, even though their constituents are the ones who most benefit from it. Yeah, it's a bit ironic, but yes, I know. I've, I've been to the States quite a lot. I was living, uh, I did some electives at Mount Sinai School of Medicine in New York. And then my uncle uh, moved from Connecticut now to Colorado. So I've been in, in the US quite a few times. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, your English is actually, you know, I don't really hear much of an accent on you either. I, I did. I don't know if, how much you read up on me, but I did my postdoc in Cambridge, UK uh, for two years, 2016 to 2018. And they always thought that I sounded very American. Yeah, I was going to say, you don't sound anything British. You sounded more like an American. Yeah. I hear that a lot. Oh. So tell me, since you don't actually manage TBI patients... What does a neurologist, you know, in Sweden do? Uh, so basically, I'm, I'm a bit of a special case because I will probably manage TBI patients. So oh, but, okay. uh, uh, what, what a neurologist would do, but, but I'm still in my residency, so I'm doing my training still. Mm -hmm. uh, but what a neurologist will do uh, depends a lot. I mean, we have the acute 
cases, which is stroke, intracerebral hemorrhages, epilepsy, and uh, like, and then there are the, the large groups. We have movement disorders such as Parkinson. We have um, a neuroinflammation like MS. We have, uh, um, top of my head, we have headache, which is also a big area. We also have some spine rehab after spinal cord injuries is, is neurologists that do. But something where, where we separate is that we don't really do dementia or neurodegenerative conditions. That's, uh, or, or dementia at least, Alzheimer's is something that the geriatric doctors in Sweden do, which in other European countries a neurologist would do. So we still have quite a few diseases that we can manage. But uh, the TBI is something that usually a neurologist in Sweden wouldn't touch because it's so complex and they think it's someone else's problem. Okay. So, I mean, wh why are, what makes you special? Because when I'm finished with my residency, I will become like, uh, like, a. Uh, a nexus or like a central point in the management of TBI patients because I have managed these patients uh, during my training and my research is heavily focused on severe TBI patients, both in the critical care units, but also in the follow-up period. So what they want me to become is like someone that will, uh, a neurologist on the neurocritical care unit, which sounds like something normal, but in Sweden, it is not that normal because it's usually run by new resurgents and new intensivists. Uh, but with a neurologist, you get a more thorough, and I think you also get a more, I don't wanna say correct, but you get a more objective assessment of the neurology of a patient. That a new resurgent is usually very focused. Is this something that I need to redo surgery on? Is this something that, will affect, uh, well, my neurosurgical, not where my neurosurgical skills will be applied on. But for a neurologist, it is more, we can focus on like if the patient also has a vertigo, if the patient also has other neurological symptoms that don't necessarily need surgery. Okay. What is your opinion of prescribing Nemenda and Aricet to TBI patients? Uh, my, uh, I, I'm first going to say that I don't really recognize the drug names. I think they're called, the generic is called something else. These are, yeah, the, one is the, the, Denazepil and, uh, let's see, what's the amendment? Memantine. Oh yeah. I, so to these are basically central stimulants. I, if I understand it correctly, yeah. is that basically you also given to people with ADHD and other like concentration disorders and there are in Sweden like two camps, basically. Some say it's fine. And then there are other people that are very sort of hesitant. And I think that the people that are fine with them, uh, they make a solid point because we don't really have much experience with them in Sweden because all this with like mild TBI, CTE, like post TBI care is very new to us. And there is no strong group of doctors that have an opinion about this. While in the US, there's definitely a, a strong group of body of patients and doctors that do have valid opinions and really want to push the field and do studies and want to try at least. I mean, I mean, don't do no harm. I mean, you can always try and see if it works. And I think that uh, in Sweden, I know Northern Sweden, there are a few doctors that work a lot with sports related concussions and they are very liberal in the prescription of these drugs. While here in Stockholm, we are somewhat restrictive uh, in the prescription of these drugs, pending better studies, I'd say. So uh, I'm trying to figure out how to phrase this. Um, we obviously have our FDA here. If it's good enough for our FDA, does, is it not good enough for, say, whatever your equivalent is? Uh, there are, I mean, they, they are two bodies that need to, uh, FDA is one. And, and of course, if something is FDA approved, it also then needs to be approved by the European body. I just, right now, I don't remember the name anymore, but the, the equivalent to the FDA in Europe, 
And then I also think that the regional one, the, the Swedish version of FDA, Läkemedelsverket, also have to approve of this drug for this indication in order to subsidize the drug for that specific uh, disease, which has not been done yet in Sweden for TBI. So it's something that you're going to have to pay for, but it will be subsidized up to when you reach a certain level either way. So doing your own clinical trials there, at one of the, or because it's decided by the EU, right? So for the most part, you're yeah, but it's also a, a lot of these decisions still lies on the different countries. So I think that Sweden, I mean, I know that different countries within the EU have different interpretations of these rules and regulations as well. Like I know Germany is probably the one with the most most restrictive drug laws um, because of what of, of, if you didn't notice that Oxycontin over here is a really bad thing. <laughs> I've heard. Yeah, yeah. And they couldn't get it passed over with their label over in Germany. So that's when I learned about that. But um, I didn't know if like, you have to run your own clinical trials aside from the ones that they ran here in the States. Is that true? That is not true. So, I mean, the, the medical bodies, I mean, the, the Swedish equivalent and the European equivalent to the FDA, they will look at the same studies and make their own assumptions. Similar to when the COVID vaccines were run, I think that the Pfizer, I think that some of these trials um, were run and were approved for both the European and the, uh, the US markets. But if you look at the, for instance, uh, my first shot was with the AstraZeneca vaccine. And if it, I'm, I'm guessing a little bit here, but I think this is correct, that that has not been approved by FDA because of some side effects but uh, you have the Moderna and the Pfizer jabs instead. In and Johnson the, in the and Johnson. US. And Johnson and Johnson. And so, so there are, I mean, there are some disparities, but I'd say that mostly they go, I mean, if something is if FDA approved, you, you, you're quite ahead in the approvals here in Europe as well. Yeah, oh, by the way, so the AstraZeneca vaccine, I know this is off TBI topic, but how many shots do you have to have? Is there a booster or like that? How did that work? So originally uh, it was developed as a two, uh, like, like one booster. Uh, but now I've actually had one AstraZeneca, one Pfizer and one Moderna. So basically they've gone with what they had available in stock when they gave us boosters. But I, I don't know any, because nowadays uh, AstraZeneca is not allowed for people under the age of 65. So they've sort of phased it out and now they're giving everyone basically the mRNA vaccine, here as we. Okay. So I guess, what are some of the, the, I'll get you out on this one. What are some of the craziest TBI patients stories that you've seen um so far during your residency the craziest like in like, what so they've what are, done to cost I, their tbi yeah like, what are the so truly odd ones you've experienced mine was i got hit by a, a car uh so it's not that odd but i mean i've heard people just like i met someone in rehab who went over their handlebars of their bicycle when they hit a speed bump like going five miles an hour and that's how they got theirs you know yeah, there is because I manage this uh, traumatic brain injury database that we have, and that contains one patient who was hit in the head with 2000 kilos of cheese. I think they were offloading cheese in some sort of cargo area, and he was hit because the, the, the reason for TBI is that it's like hit by cheese. Well, a, lo a lot of cheese. You didn't get to personally see this patient. I did not personally see the cheese. I think I actually might have seen the patient who was then unconscious. Uh, but I mean, he looked like any other patient, but I would have wanted to see the cheese as well, in a way. Wow. That's definitely, <laughs> I never would have imagined that. Okay. Well, cheese can be bad. And I mean, if you're hit from the wrong end with the edge, it could be a penetrating TBI as well, maybe. I don't know. Yeah. But, uh, this this was a blood danger, I think. That's definitely a different story. Well, hey, Doc, thanks for joining me today. I don't want to hold you up any longer. I appreciate your time.
no worries. I, I didn't know what this was going to be about, but uh, yeah. It's, yeah, it's, it was going to be mostly about TBIs and stuff, but yeah. we got a little bit of everything in there. Yeah. Sounds good. Thanks again, Doc. Hopefully you, yeah. let's see, what is it? Oh, enjoy the rest of your afternoon if you can. What time do you get off today on call? Uh, tomorrow at 9. PM? Oh, oh, that's AM because you're 24 hours. AM, clock. exactly. So midnight, your time. Uh, yeah. Okay. All but, right. Uh, I like free in the morning, I think, Eastern time. So that's when I get off. So it, this, I've actually, you see this, this is the bed. So I can, I caught some sleep before uh, this talk. So it was nice. Is it comfortable? Is this like out of a five star rating? Tell me what you would rate this hotel three, four? The funny thing is that my wife, uh, they, there was a lot of talk in her work that they were going to be on a retreat in a luxury hotel. And then they revealed that we're going to the uh, elite hotel, Carolina Tower, which is this hotel, and then said it was a luxury hotel. Me, I stay here every other night and I can't really say it's luxury. Like there's a bathtub, for instance. That what? is definitely what I say. It's something that if you if you say luxury to me, you need at least a pool or a, <laughs> at least a bathtub. <laughs> and uh, it has nothing. Uh, it, it basically, the breakfast is rather cheap as well. It, it tastes very sort of, uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, they've definitely bought their raw material from the lowest bidder. Okay. Well, thanks again, Doc. I appreciate it. Yep. Good luck with your day. And good luck with the triathlons. Thank you. Mm -hmm.